What up? Check, check. What's the deal? How you guys doing? It's Charlie Newhart with the Charlie Newhart Show. Be humble. What's going on, man? Got my Grand Hill popping. You know what I'm saying? God is good all the time. Man, God is so amazing. I wake up in the morning to spend some time just thanking him for everything that he did. Type in the chat things that you grateful God did for you. I remember I was working a job at Ford Motor Company. I hated it from 1999 to 2007. I just asked God, please get me out of here. And I was in a church and a pastor wrote, uh, talked about Habakkuk chapter two, verse two through three, write the vision, make it plain. I went home that day. I wrote down a goal that I wanted to get out of Ford Motor Company in 2007 at the age of 29. Took a couple years. I made some changes, started really living right, doing the right thing. God got me out at age 29, January 2007, and gave me $100,000 to leave. God is faithful. God is amazing. When we rehearse those testimonies about things that God has done for us, it keeps us out of depression. And it's a lot. I don't know if y'all noticed now, but it's a lot of people suffering from a lot of, especially since the pandemic, a lot of mental illnesses and depression and sadness. One of the things that will keep people out of depression, sadness, mental illness, Spending quality time with God, one-on-one alone time with God, rehearsing the testimonies about what he did. Internet lagging for real? Or is that you? Or is that your uh, stand-up wireless? I seen a dude in a wheelchair outside of this Myers on 8 Mile in Woodward selling cell phones, and the name of the cell phone company was Stand Up Wireless. I was blown away. Oh, yeah, I still use the old flip phone. You ever see somebody asking for money outside of a store sitting in a wheelchair, but his shoes is dirty? <laughs> my dog, my man been walking. His shoes is dirty. If you in a wheelchair, your shoes supposed to be super clean. How you asking for money at the intersection and your shoes is dirty, man? How the internet looking? It's lagging. Top notch internet, fam. That bucket hat came with a pound of cooked cook shrimp. I'm crying. Cleveland 216. Scotty Jenkins, what up? Internet good? Yeah, man, that's Divine Bebop. He got that trash renter center internet. My man got his internet on rent. Internet solid over here, fam. Yeah, yeah, I feel that. If you got dirty, if you asking for money in a wheelchair and you got dirty shoes, 100% Rotten Podcast said, I'm tipping you over. You tripping. Literally saw this yesterday. My man was sitting in a wheelchair and he didn't even have the bottom feet part, like uh, covering his feet or whatever with, that attached to the wheelchair. Shoes was filthy. I said, dog been out here walking, man. You sitting in the wheelchair to get a bag. And if you're that intuitive, you should get a gig, big dog. So start out your day giving thanks. Let's make the transition. How y'all feel, man? Where everybody from? How was your week? What kind of victories and testimonies do you have? Or if you just want to roast, Holler at me. God allowed me to wake up and instill the knowledge and wisdom to teach young minds. I love it. He allowed you to wake up today. That's a blessing. Just God is so faithful, man. Just think about it. No matter what we did last night, no matter what we had going on, when we woke up this morning, God was faithful enough to bring the sun out. Wake us up in the morning. If you hear now, God woke you up. I'm super grateful for that. Uh, you know, I've been through it all. 
I had cancer when I was 15. I got shot when I was 23. I got hit by a car when I was 14. I done been through it all. But what keeps me sane, what keeps me grateful and thankful and grounded is that I'm always thinking like, thank God, but you did all these things for me. You didn't have to. You did this. You did this. You stopped me from getting killed when that gun, when that bullet went off. Like, nap time. What up? Boston tapping in. I want to do a show in Boston, man. 100%. But yeah, that's the key. That's the key to keep it a positive, positive mental attitude, man. It's just Seattle. What's going on? I want to do a show out in Seattle too, man. I think Nate Jackson got a comedy club out there in, um, in Seattle. Man, Evan, I'm going to have to get at you. I want to put together a show in Boston. Like I got a couple shows at the end of this year. I'm doing a show in Vegas, LA and Detroit. I want to add Atlanta, Boston, um, and maybe even one more city. The show in Detroit did so good. It was just like a trial run because I had never did a show just by myself. Um, so the trial run sold out. It was an amazing show. I was like, okay, so now it's time to take it to, to different cities. So uh, that's what's coming. Oh, I'm doing a show in Cali, Shea Sweets. <laughs> You already know I'm doing a, uh, uh, it's going to be at a, uh, I don't even want to say, but when I come back out there, that's when I'm going um, to do that, that Cali show. How big of a venue you looking for? I'm going to email, I'm going to see you my email in the chat, G. So we can, um, just don't do nothing weird with my email. The man just sent a shirtless Tyler Perry pic to me like, yeah, man, this is me standing in front of the venue in Boston. Like, why you ain't got no shirt on, dog? I see you looking like a determined Joe Button. I'm crying. Eastern Europe in the building. D. Ziggin is over in the red light district with no pants on right now. Crying. We'll get on y'all head right now. I got a really dope show lined up, man. Um, oh, you in the red light district right now with no pants on? Oh, man. I'm tripping. My man is in the tub listening to Sade right now. This is no, uh, ain't Sade from uh, Europe. Sebastian Shaw in the building. What's going on? Let's get right to it. All right, here we go. I got four firstborn children. Four. Four firstborn children. Yeah, I had a bunch of baby mamas. You ain't a real player until you've seen your baby mamas fight. Let's just get that out the way. When you, if you've seen your baby mamas go at it and you just kind of let them work, then you're a real player. You're real. When you watch them work and then figure out which one you're going to pick for later, like whoever wins is going to be the one that I select. I watched my baby mamas fight 20 something years ago. You know how when you get, when you, when you, you have kids and then your, your ex, decides not to let you see your kids like this is a move that she made years ago 20 something years ago i had two little girls my ex you know i married somebody else and she was like okay with well, it you ain't gonna see your babies no more so she was keeping them from me you know and then one day she called me and said hey if you bring your wife over here and introduce her to me i'll let you see your daughters and they was like, they was young. And my wife at the time was like, Charlie, this ain't a good idea. But I'm like, listen, I want to see my babies. All right. You're not going to keep me from my babies. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I want to see my little girl. So she tried to fight me on it, whatever. So we end up going. So we get over there. And uh, conversation was going really good really fruitful it was like yeah this i just want to introduce myself to you blah 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 
you know, and then she just started shooting off these commands and demands about what she wanted. She was just like, you know, I'm going to let my daughters come to y'all house, but I don't ever want you touching or doing their hair. You know what I'm saying? Don't ever do their hair. And I was like, oh, okay. And then she just started getting more and more angrier as she started blurting out these commands and demands. And then my wife at the time, she looked at me and she said, Charlie, I think it's time for us to go. I said, you're right. So we walking away from the porch. We had this whole conversation on uh, my baby mama's front porch. And my baby mama said, that's right, because you're about to get your A beat on my porch. And I'm like, yeah, let's go ahead and get out of here. So we try to get to the car. My baby mama jumped off the porch, ran up to my wife, hit her with a strong right hook. Connected, too. Strong connection. It made a sound. It had a sound effect to it, like a movie. It was like, boom. And I watched her kind of stumble a little bit. And then my baby mama came with a cold left hook. It was like a Tyson hook. Wham! Stung her twice. And I'm looking like, wait a minute, man. Did I marry the wrong one? You mean tell me my wife can't fight? She didn't just ate two Coney dogs. And we was right in the city, too. We was at, like, Plymouth Plymouth and Southfield. We was in the hood in Detroit. She hit her. And then all of a sudden, my wife, my ex-wife, now, redeemed herself. Pulled out something shiny. She pulled a long knife out. And I was like, oh, no, because I was probably about eight feet away from the activity. Pulled out the knife and then just started working. And I think I could be mistaken, but I think she was making sound effects as she was stabbing. She was working. Stabbing my baby mama. Stabbed her 13 times. She, which she was right. It was a bad idea to go over there. Once I saw the knife come out, I was like, she's probably right. It was a bad idea. Watch the stabbing 13 times. And I don't know about y'all, but when there's a knife out, I ain't really trying to get in between because I don't want to get I don't want to get hit. So stabbed her 13 times. And then uh, her boyfriend, my baby mama's boyfriend, came out the house. He like 6'8". 200 some pounds. I got my fist balled up, but he ran over and grabbed her, took her in the house. Um, fast forward. She turned around and just gave me custody. She turned around, and just gave me custody of the babies. Like six months later, just gave them to me and then moved out of town. So, if you want to get custody of your kids, you got to marry a chick from the east side of Detroit who carries a knife. <laughs> Charlie, baby mom probably had a soundtrack. Hey, it was, it was, it was insane, dog. It was insane. And this was the baby mama. This was the wife who ended up shooting me later on. So I watched her stab my baby mama. I watched her. She threatened to stab my neighbor one time. I was, I ain't gonna lie, I was kind of doing some dirtbaggery. I was, I was, I was flirting with the neighbor in front of the house, talking real slick. So I thought, I thought my wife was asleep. So I was saying a little stuff to her, whatever. And then I kind of started ignoring her. And she kept saying something to me, saying stuff to me. And all of a sudden, from the front, from the window, my wife was like, he said, leave him alone. He ain't no, she said, he's ignoring you for a reason. Now leave him alone before I come down there and stab your ass. Okay, yeah, she uh, she bought that life. She one hundred percent bought that life. One thousand percent. What else do I got here? This is just me randomly. This is just ranting. Okay, if you mad at your fifteen year old daughter about her twerking on IG, instead of cussing her out, telling her she a hoe and all this other stuff, why don't you just be honest with her and just tell her that you used to you was twerking. At uh, at Freaknik, because with the Freaknik tapes, they're out now on Hulu, so you can't hide that past. You can't be all getting on your daughter. Like there's a such thing as generational iniquities. Okay, you can't be getting on your daughter about twerking on IG when you was in Freaknik going in. Divine Bebop in Chicago, what's up? another thing what's another what's another rant before i get into today's subject um 
I met Lizzo. I met Lizzo about about a year ago. It was uh, it was really kind of. I saw her at Somerset Mall. Couldn't believe it. I saw her at Somerset Mall, which is just kind of an upscale mall in Michigan. I saw her, and she had a flat tire. And I was like, dang, that's Lizzo. I want to go help her. You know what I'm saying? So I was getting out of my car, and she had already hopped out of her car. She walked over to her flat tire, dropped down to her knees, wrapped her mouth around the valve stem, and blew up the tire on her own. I couldn't believe it. She's a walking air compressor, dog. Amazing. Charlie built like Maxwell stunt double. <laughs> Man, you got more Coco Couture Maxwell jokes. I'm convinced that you threw a pair of your draws on stage at a Maxwell concert, Evan. Convinced. Absolutely. I think he threw his draws on stage. All right. So let's get down to it. Dropped down her knees and blew up the tire, Dezigga. Never seen anything like that in my life. Amazing. That's somebody I need on my team, man. Somebody who could just blow up a tire that's flat. <laughs> okay. So here's some thoughts. I feel like Lack of fathers in the home have changed the game. It definitely changed the game. I mean, you can look at the statistics and see, but but this is what I think is the fundamental difference between LeBron James and Michael Jordan. It's fathers. And I'm not saying that either man is perfect, and I'm not saying that either man is better than the other. I'm just saying that there's a difference. Michael Jordan never publicly said, I am the greatest in the world. I'm the best in the world. He showed it when he played, but he never just outright said it. I'm better than everyone else. He never had that kind of behavior. Being raised around a strong man will prevent you from having that type of behavior. Now, did Michael Jordan have his flaws? Yes, because on the flip side of it, LeBron has a school. I love what he's doing with his brand, his wife, his kids. He's very hands-on. So again, this is not me saying a negative or a positive with either one, I'm just pointing out the differences of having a father in your home, a present father in your home, and how you behave. Dash Lemire, what's popping? Charlie sold dope and water balloons to save money. <laughs> Marvin Sapp got a restraining order on you. I already know it. So the difference in fathers. So there's a certain way that strong and present fathers behave. It's a certain way. Like, I never saw my dad criticize people. When I'm seeing some of these NBA players criticize and get mad at the refs publicly and speak on all this stuff publicly, like, to me, it's it's just, it's weird. It's, it's a certain way that a real man behaves. And you kind of learn that behavior by being raised around strong men. Now, let's just say it ain't your father. Let's say you got strong uncles. Strong uncles, um, any kind of strong male influence in your life prevents you from behaving a certain way. When I watch these NBA players and the way they behave now, it irritates me. And I can tell, like, there's no strong man in that home at all. Why are you publicly saying that I'm the, I'm, I'm the greatest in the world? I'm better than everyone else. This flop game is so unreal. When I see NBA players arguing with the referees, it pisses me off. Pisses me off. Now, I never watch WNBA games or women's basketball. Like, I watch the highlights, but I don't want to see it. Ain't nobody dunking. It's not no, it's not real physical. I don't want to see it. So, and the stats speak for themselves. Look at how many people watch WNBA games compared to NBA games. I don't want to see that. But I did see a clip of Caitlin Clark's father barking at her on the sidelines and telling her, stop arguing with the refs and just play. And that's what a father does. Like, why don't you just play? 
You arguing with this man who had already made the call. You look stupid. Just play the game. Just shut up and play. That's what a father does. And I think that's the difference between today's w, today's NBA and yesterday's NBA. And that's the difference between LeBron and Michael Jordan. And honestly, that's the difference between a lot of people that you communicate with today. The presence of a strong father in the home. And the statistics, let's go to the stats because they're kind of sad. That's why if you got children, be willing to fight their mama for a relationship with them. You heard me. Be willing to fight that woman for a relationship with your kid. Even if you married to her, you may have to fight her on some stuff. No, no, no. Don't put that on him. I don't like that. Pants is too tight. You're going to have to fight her for a relationship with your kid, whether you with her or not. Okay. Fatherless homes. How we looking? This is why, no matter what's going on with my exes, because look, I'm a I'm I'm a recovered dirt bag, recovering and recovered dirt bag. But no matter what happened to my relationships, I fight for my relationship with my kids. I've had to fight in court for my kids. Hire attorneys. Like I'm gonna fight their mamas for my relationship with them because I want them. And whether or not my job is to give them the truth and give them the game, I'm detached from the outcome because all I can do is give it to you, and you will never be able to say nobody ever told me. So, you see my kids acting up, doing whatever they whatever they doing. You, if you talk to them personally, can none of them can never say my dad never told me. I gave him the game. Forty three percent of U.S. children children live without their father. 90% of homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. Jesus. Man, you got to be willing to fight that woman for that kid, man. You have to be. Be a present father. Most of the failed relationships and friendships that I, that I was in, when I look at the, the central dynamic of probably one of the reasons why it didn't work out is I came from a strong, present father home. Present father was in my home, and they didn't have it. And the way we handle conflicts is different. I'm talking about like my dad never did drugs, never cheated on my mama, never drank. They've been married. My dad is 70, 73. Him and my mom been married for 50, 50 years. I never seen dysfunction. I never seen them argue. Never seen them hit her. Never seen my dad. Never did drugs. Never drank. I'm not saying he's perfect, but I'm just saying he was consistent. He was faithful. This is the type of man that I grew up with. And not only that, the way he handled conflict. You know what I'm saying? I remember when me and my brother was like 12 or 13. We was at home while my parents was at work. And my neighbor came by the house and asked to use our lawnmower. I was like, all right, you can use it. So when we came home, we told our, when my dad came home, me and my brother told him, hey, such and such came by here and asked to use a lawnmower. He did what? Y'all come with me. So we went next door. My dad knocked on the door. Dude answered. He said, did you come to my house and ask to use my lawnmower? Ask my kids to use my lawnmower and I wasn't home? And the dude, while he was saying yes, my dad said, don't you ever do that again. Don't you come to my house and ask my kids to use my stuff. You understand me? It was so many lessons that day, like real men will confront each other. He never talked crap about the neighbor behind his back. When there was a violation, he confronted him, and then he brought us with him to show this is how you handle conflict face to face. When I see internet beefs, and text message beefs, and men talking about other men behind their back, like if my dad was a hoe, he could have just sat at home like, I can't believe my came over here, man. He Gonna ask, we should move. Man, I can't believe, it. and they just talk about him for six weeks. Can't believe he came by here, man. Can you believe that? And telling everybody, he handled it immediately, and he didn't. He wasn't yelling. He ain't boss up on him, have his fist balled up. He's just like, let me just confront you. A real man confronts. The Bible says that peacemakers are blessed, not peacekeepers. People who are always trying to keep the peace don't want to confront. That's not when you bless. The Bible says peacemakers are blessed. That's the type of man that I grew up around. And my uncles, granddad, everybody was the same. Everybody was the same. So when you grow up seeing that, because some stuff is caught, not taught. You catch certain things being around 
being in certain environments. So that's the way I believe and handle conflict. And not only that, like the next day, I saw my dad being all friendly with the neighbor. Hey, what's going on? Let me have you work on your race car, blah, 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 blah. A real man, I confront you and I'm not holding on to no grudge. But when you haven't been raised around a real man and you get checked or confronted or the situation don't work out, you all in your feelings for six weeks like a female. That's feminine energy. I've never seen my dad walk around holding a grudge against somebody else. They had a conversation. They confronted the issue. Then they moved on. He, he did the same with us. We did something he didn't like. Whether he whooped us or checked us, it was, hey, I still love you. Just don't like what you did. Hey, you want to go to the park? What I look like as a man holding a grudge against another man for six weeks. Some stuff I just don't even remember. You wronged me. I told you about it. Told you I didn't like it. Forgive you. Move on. You can apologize to me about it six years later. And I'm like, dog, I don't remember that. I've walked away from that. We already had our confrontation. We already had our conversation. I'm not about to sweat you about that, man. That's the benefit of growing up around a real man. <laughs> Y'all tripping. WNBA is back assistant. What up, though, Frank? Charlie lost his keys, blowing a kiss at the former. <laughs> Charlie's son draw Glock switches in art class. I'm crying. Crying. Evan make people take their shoes and socks off when they walk in his house. He got a whole photo album full of men's feet at his crib. <laughs> uh, yeah. White girl daddy was right. What you mean? I'm crying. Yeah, man. I'm saying. Fathers, present fathers. I'm going to tell you one of the biggest things that I learned from my dad is, is, is um, if you have a problem with somebody, you go to them face to face and you keep it between that person. I never seen my dad talking about his friends behind their back. Never seen him dogging like the church we went to or the pastor or the or the deacons, or I'd never seen him talking about people behind their back, really at all. If he had a problem with you, it was face to face because whether you know this or not, you lose what you criticize. You criticize it, you talk about it, you lose it. I've watched people in situations talk about everybody around them and then wonder why everybody left or why everybody leaves. It's like or why a spouse left you or relationship left you. It's, there's an invisible oil between relationships. It's called the joint. But when you talk about a person when they're not around, it affects the oil between the relationships. So think about your joints. Your joints are held together by ligaments. And there's like muscles and tissue and even like oil in between your joints. Well, let's call it blood. So the we the reason the joint operates optimally is because the tendons, the muscles, and everything in between. So when you start talking about a person that you're joined with, relationship or a friendship, you start to affect that those joints. You start to affect the muscles, the tendons. You basically wear out the relationship the more you talk about that person behind their back. I'm not a fan of talking about people behind their back. Like, I joke and clown, but nine times out of ten, if I'm saying something behind your back, I've said it to your face, or I'm, I have, I've said it to your face already. But we lose. We criticize what we lose. We lose relationships and friendships. We lose business connections when we talk trash about people when they're not around, when they don't have the opportunity to defend themselves. And honestly, that shows me a whole lot about your character. If you dog in somebody around me that you've known for 10, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, especially, and I just, I've only known you a year, what make me so special? You're doing the same thing about me when I ain't around. And then all of a sudden you see that person ain't around no more, and it's like that affects the relationship. If I got a problem with you, I'm coming to you face to face. Hey, what's up with this? I didn't like this. Charlie went to Comic Con just to. I just to slap nerds. <laughs> the Ziggin is over in uh, the red light district. 
tripping. They got Motel 6s over there. Every time you see a Motel 6, you want to break down an eight ball and get wasted. <laughs> GK, what's popping? Statistics of fathers in the home. Body count? Who asked? That better not be a man asking questions like that. I don't ask that question. I don't ask a female what her body count is. I honestly don't even know what mine is. Do y'all ask females that? You meet them? Not just females. When you get females or males, when you get into a relationship or a friend a relationship, do you ask you ask the other person what their body count is? You ask a woman what her body count is, she ain't gonna tell you the truth because if she told you the truth, she your soul would leave your body. You know what I'm saying? How many how many men you been with, baby? Seven hundred. If she say seven hundred. Your soul is going to leave your body. You're going to be through. Dylan chilling. Charlie's still trying out for a semi-pro football team every summer. <laughs> you cash apping a girl in Africa right now that you ain't met in two years. Cut that out. Um, so somebody asked me to address this. So when you get into a relationship, I believe you should ask the tough questions. You should ask, ask the tough questions in the beginning. And a lot of people don't know what tough questions to ask. So I'm going to give you some, you can research more, but I think before you get really, really close to somebody, before you develop a soul tie with somebody, there's certain questions you should ask in a relationship. All right. About traumas, triggers. Past. I remember I was in a matter of fact, the woman who shot me. I remember one time I had the music blasting real loud at home. Right. And she got off work and came in the house and was freaking out, going crazy, cussing, going wild. Tears coming down her eyes, cut the music off, blah, blah, blah. And then we had a sit down at the table. She broke down and told me, like, well, the reason that I don't like loud music is my mom was on drugs. She said, my mom was on drugs when I was growing up. And whenever she would do drugs, she would lock me in a room. She said I was five and my mama would lock me in a room and, and cut the music up real loud so I wouldn't hear what she was doing. She said, and I'd be there in there from like six in the evening to like nine, ten in the morning. And she said it got so bad that I would have to pack a lunch. She said I would make sandwiches. This is a five-year-old. She said I would make sandwiches and hide them in my dresser drawers because when my mom would see food in my room, she would take it and be mad. So she said I had to hide food in my room because I knew that at any given time when she wanted to do drugs, she'd lock me in the room and play music all day. And I'm like, damn, that's a hell of a trigger. Like, I, I can't even play loud music at the house. So you need to understand what you're dealing with when you get with somebody, what their triggers are, what were their traumas when they grew up. I mean, a little later, I'm going to talk about this lady who grew up in Egypt. And she experienced all kind of trauma as a, young, as a young lady. Didn't end up killing her husband later on and doing some of the same things to him that was done to her when she was little. I'm going to bring that up later, but you got to talk about that. And of course, those conversations ain't going to come out the first time y'all talk. But over time, you got to be purposeful. Dating is not just going out to have sex with people. It's asking questions to see if this is the person you want to spend the rest of your life with. I know so many people. I got family members, man. They in their 70s talking about how miserable they are in this relationship for years. And it's like, man, you, you only got your youth and your beauty and just your strength like this for a season. Why would you waste it or settle? You got to ask the questions. So traumas, what have you been through? So once y'all get comfortable, 
you know, it'll probably start off because transparency should be contagious with a sane individual. So maybe you talk about some of your traumas and triggers. You know what I'm saying? Some of the things that you've went through, your past. But you got to ask the questions. Like, are you on, do you have any PTSD from anything you went through? Are you on any medication? Okay. And make a list. And if she's never had one, you got to help her create one so you know what you're dealing with. Say she got kids and you just ask her, so how you feel about me spanking your son? Or you better not ever touch my son or I dog walk you. Okay. Well, then that's a, that's a check. Don't whoop the kid. We get into these situations and we think love is just going to smooth over certain things. You need to understand, hey, I got kids. You can't never touch them. Okay, well, you uh, here's my trigger. Don't ever let your son disrespect me. If I can't hit him, he get out of line. You need to slap him in his mouth right there on the spot. You know, and then mar good, good marriage counseling at some churches will possibly cover these things. But you can't depend on your church to solve all your needs. Can't depend on your past, that pastor to tell you everything. You got to do your own research. So you need to ask these questions. You got kids, she got kids. How's the discipline? How's the financing? You know, some ain't nobody gonna touch my money. Some women, some men, and but this is my money. Are we gonna do uh same bank account, split bank account? How you feel about that? Why don't we ask the appropriate questions, man? Do we just be so in love? We be so wanting to smash that we don't ask the questions. Christian Clayton, what up, though? See, they always say it's under five. Dating just to smash is a waste of time. Most men won't feel that. That's true. Dating just to smack after 30. Well, I, yeah, let me say for me, after 40. Um, Dirtbag years were a little extensive. Um, you got to date to ask the appropriate questions. You know what I'm saying? And then you got to ask the question to a woman. You got to, I feel like you should ask her, how was your relationship with your father? Oh, he wasn't there. Did you have any strong male influence in your life? No, you hate all men. You hate your father. I don't even know if I can continue to do this. Like that's, I'm going to step away at that point because you've never been around a man. How you know, how you going to know how to treat me? We mistreat what we don't understand. And vice versa, a woman should be asking a man, how's your relationship with your mom? There's a lot of men walking around here with, with, with mama issues. Mama raised him to believe that it's his job to take care of her. You know, he's willing to sacrifice his family to make sure his mama got a house and all this other stuff. And it's like, I honestly, it ain't nothing wrong with looking out for your mama, but your mama shouldn't be running you while you marry. You know what I'm saying? So, you got to ask them type of questions, man. And I just don't think we don't. I don't think we ask the appropriate questions in friendships. We know people by observation, revelation, and recommendation. And I, I can't take no credit for that. That came from Bishop Ben Jabert. Rest in peace. One of the greatest pastors in the world. Observation, revelation, recommendation. You got to watch people for a while. Observation, revelation, pray about them. Recommendation, ask their friends. Ask their circle about them. What's going on with this person? I know what my triggers are now. Like, it took me some time. I know what I want and I know what I don't want. I cannot be around a woman who has high anxiety. I can't do it. Because to me, that's an indication that you don't trust God. Why are you praying if you're worrying? you basically saying, God can't do this. I can do it better on my own. He's taking too long to do it. And I'm just freaking out. I can't be around people who freak out. I can't be around people with high anxiety. Like, I'm an empath. My spirit is sensitive. I'll pick all of that up. And if you're just worrying all the time, all this anxiety and everything around that, I can't do it. It triggers me. It'll trigger me to go leave the house and go do some bull crap. Can't be with nobody. And everybody's different. Everybody's different. Every relationship is different. Some people may be able to deal with that. I know what I can't deal with. I know what triggers me. And that's a trigger that I'll express in the beginning. You know what triggers me? High anxiety. Do you have that? Tell me now so I can leave. Because I'd rather leave now than you be got high anxiety in the house and I go out and do something stupid to feel better. Complainers. That's a trigger for me. I cannot be around people who complain all the time. I can't. I've seen it. I've been through it all, man. Hit by a car, shot, cancer. 
I'd have been broke, had money, been broke again. I'd have been hating on. There's a million things I can, I can sit here and complain about. But why? I choose to dwell on things that are pure, just, honest, great. Let me just talk about what I'm grateful for. I can't stand being around complainers, man. You know, I can't stand being around people who, who are blaming everyone else for their current situation in life. Your life, you choice driven. If you're a blamer, if it's everybody else's fault all the time, I don't want to be around you. What else? What else is a trigger for me? People who are lazy. That's a trigger. <sighs> Look, man, I got it. I got a ton of kids, man, and I still make it happen. It ain't no excuses. No excuses, man. None at all. Especially if I got kids and you don't, and you asking me for money, it's a problem. It's a problem, man. I give you money. That's taken away from my babies. What you mean? What up, Charlie? Charlie that did he ask him too many questions and he went missing. I'm crying. <laughs> uh, you tripping, dog. You tripping. Who is that, Christian? What's up, Christian? How you feel, man? Christian, when you hear a zipper, your mouth waters, man. Diddy is out here getting it done, ain't he? Christian, you gave a pint of blood at a Diddy's party. Look, the only way we're going to let you in, Christian, is you're going to have to give a pint of blood, man. My dog out here giving blood at parties. <laughs> uh, know your triggers, man. Somebody asked me last week, too. I'm going to tell you, here's another trigger for me. When I'm around... This is a trigger in friendships and relationships. This is some, it's a trigger for me. I just can't take it. When I'm around people who worship their thoughts, and they always playing mental chess. Look, I'm gonna say this, and and this will do that. This, I'm not. Look, I'm not really that smart in those type of conversations. I'm saying what I feel and what I'm thinking about. But I'm not digging deep that every word is some type of chess move to make you say or do something like that ain't even the way my mind works. And when I'm around people who are trying to tell me how I think or try to manipulate my thoughts and my actions to benefit themselves in their conversation, it's 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 a trigger for me. I'm like, wait a minute, man. I'm not playing mental chess every time I'm having a conversation with somebody. I'm not doing art of war and 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 uh, uh, forty eight laws of power in every single conversation. I'm not. Now, are there times where I am probably in business, um, and, and in very calculated situations? It's a strong possibility I'm doing forty eight laws of power, art of war. You know, I'm being strategic in how I handle information because it's a contract on the table, it's a bag on the table, then yeah. But if I'm just having a regular conversation with friends and family, it's like I'm not always on this art of war, 48 laws of power, mental chess game with conversations with people. That's not me. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about God. I'm talking about testimony. I'm asking you what your goals are. I'm asking you how you feel. I'm not playing a mental game. It's That's a trigger for me. It's a trigger. And I'm not mad at the people. I'm just talking about me when I'm around people who behave that way. It's a trigger for me. And if you worship your thoughts, that's a problem. Because here's the di somebody asked me to talk about this last week to explain the difference between worship and value. When you value your thoughts, okay, that's a great thought. I'd love to do that. Let me write down the T of the pros and cons if I do this. I was talking about a thought that pops in your head. Or, you know, it's a good idea, but let me run it by. Let me get some counsel because the Bible says in a multitude of counselors, there's safety. So let me write this down. Um, Or let me pray about it. Let me take some time. These are good thoughts. So let me wait because God says the uh, he speaks once, yea, twice, yet even in a dream. If it's something God is trying to get to you, you'll keep hearing it over and over again. And you'll get a dream. But people who just like, no, nope, it's my thought. It was in my head. They're so subjective. That's a trigger for me. 
It's an absolute trigger because that's the difference between worship and value. When you value, you run it through some filters, take some time, and then you go with it. But when you worship your thoughts, you feel like every single thing that's in your brain you're supposed to do. Every single thought you come up with, you're supposed to act on it. That's not true. So there's been times when my mind has been wrong several times. You know that old uh, Ghetto Boy song, My Mind Is Playing Tricks On Me? Can't believe your mind all the time, man. Sometimes you're wrong. And guess what? It's okay to be wrong. And just be honest. I think that's another one of my triggers. And everybody going to have their own, but I'm just talking about some of the things that know what your triggers are. I think you should actually sit down and write down a list of what you believe your triggers are before getting into a relationship and have the list ready. So when you ask somebody you dating, you can be like, look, what are your triggers? What are your traumas? Here are mine. And when you send them yours, because nine times out of 10, they won't have a list. You send them yours. That'll help them formulate a list of what yours, what, what theirs will be. One of my triggers is I can't, I have a tough time being around people who are not accountable. I call you out on the carpet on this, like you own video right here, spilling food on the floor. Like this is probably to my kids, spilling food on the floor. This is you on video. No, that ain't me. It's you. No, I mean, it's like you get pointed out on something that's so obvious and you can't just like Jesse Smoulet. Come on, man. You hired them Nigerians to pour bleach on you and all that other stuff. We know everybody know you lying. Why aren't you just saying, man, I'm, I'm sorry for wasting everybody's time, taxpayers, courts. I did it. I'm sorry. He's still walking into court. I'm innocent, man. Free me. Come on, bro. We know you did it. That's lack of accountability. That's a trigger for me. That'll make me slap somebody. For real. Lack of accountability. I hate it. Like with a passion. Can't even be around it. Can't be around it at all. Lack of accountability. Uh, people who can't take correction. Man, I was in a relationship, man. I was married to somebody for years. And anytime you went to this person with a, some type of Hey, this hurt my feelings. Hey, I appreciate it. If you wouldn't do this again, flip out. Instead of just saying, you know what, you're right. Or I ain't even got to hear you right. Just say, I'll make that change or just do it. But to totally flip it on me and I'm like, you did this. It's a trigger. Can't take correction, lack of accountability. Super, super trigger. Jay Jimerson, what's popping, man? Reno Molina, 100% facts, classic. Pride gets in the way along, along all the time. So the Bible talks about how in the last days, people will suffer from lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. I heard a really dope pastor. Her name is uh, Dr. Cherie Stain, Detroit Worship Center. It's also called United Now. She preached a message on pride of life years ago because her husband passed away, who was my pastor, 2017. And um, she preached a message talking about, she said, I just want to be honest with y'all with, with one of the things that took uh, my husband, your pastor out. One of the, one of the, one of the things that the devil used was pride of life. And she gave us a definition on pride of life that I'll never forget. She said, we think pride of life is that we're just walking around thinking we are better than everybody else. She said, no, pride of life is when you have so much knowledge, you've learned so much, you read so many books. You're so puffed up with information. You think it's your job to give all of that information to everyone you're around. And then people start pulling on you. And every time somebody pulls on you and asks you for something, you think it's your job to help them. She said that's what killed him. Because he felt it was his job to help and do for so many people that it ended up pulling on him, making him sick. And that's what ended up being part of his demise. And it's sad because he was one of the greatest men in the body of Christ. He was one of the best pastors I ever had. You know what I'm saying? Not messing with the money. Was rich before he came with, before he became a pastor. Not messing with people in the church. It's one of the greatest movements in the body of Christ from 2005 to 2017 for 12 years. And she, when she went into detail about why he passed, she said it was pride of life. He thought that it was his job to fix and help everybody around him. And it made him sick. And that's what ended up killing him. 52 years old. Rest in peace. Matt Cab, thanks for thanks for tuning in, fam. Hit that like button, man. I appreciate y'all. 
I just want to thank everybody that donated last time too, man. That was all 100. That goes to uh, Reno Molina. What's cracking? That goes to a special fund, the special fund to support all my kids. So I appreciate y'all. But she said that's what took him out is pride of life. And honestly, that's something that I had to work on for myself because I feel like we attract what we are. And I know that was me. I felt like it was, I wanted to help drag everybody around me to destiny, help everybody, do everything I could for everybody. But ultimately it was wearing me down. And at the end of the day, sometimes you help people by telling them no. You know what I'm saying? I can't help everybody. Appreciate that, Jay Jimerson, having the I Am Dirt Bag on tap. 100%. Yeah, rest in peace. So he he had a, uh, you know, he was um, just an awesome man of God. And he passed away, and it hurt. Like, I've never been a part of a church that has been like it ever since 2017. You're talking about seven years later. But at the end of the day, we all have to have our own personal relationship with God. So since then, I've found out God to be my God, not through nobody else's lens. But pride gets in the way. So that's another um, that's another red flag. That's definitely a red flag is 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 like somebody who feels like it is the, the, they have all the wisdom and knowledge to give to everyone else. You can't tell them nothing. They didn't experience it all. OK, if you've experienced it all, you've seen it all, then you should have a level of success that equates to everything that you've been through. But it's a lot of people that got a ton of advice. But when you look at their life, they ain't really living what they said. They ain't did it. Like, I can sit here and run my whole resume down of what I've done. And I've had several, I've got great accomplishments and great failures. I'm a huge balance of my successes and failures. But I have some successes. I have some things that I went out there and accomplished. You know, I booked TV roles, movie roles. I've sold several, I've flipped a bunch of houses. I've had my hand in some of everything, man. But I've also experienced the other side of it where, I've been a dirtbag in relationships and they fell apart. You know what I'm saying? I chose wrong. We haven't been taught how to pick. And that's why I be giving so much game on what it takes, what you should be looking for when you pick. Because I've picked wrong. I can't even sit here and bash these other people I've been in a relationship with. Because at the end of the day, I picked wrong. When I hear people bashing the person they had kids by, like that's the person you picked. How you gonna get mad at somebody that you picked, dog? Work on who you, work on yourself. You change what you attract. So when I got when when I talked when I met my ex wife, she told me that her mom was on drugs, and she had to hide food in her room because I'm talking about the trigger of the music because I had a bunch of loud music playing when we got married and it triggered her and she went off and she ended up telling me that she don't like loud music because her mom used to play loud music when she did drugs. She said, when I was little, when I was five, my mama played loud music, locked me in a room and would play loud music uh, for hours while she did drugs. So I couldn't play loud music. I, I started to figure out what her triggers and her traumas was over time. You know what I'm saying? And then she told me she didn't have a dad, never had a relationship with a, with a man. So I was foreign to her. I was a unicorn. How do you know how to treat somebody you've never been around? And I watched her wild out sometimes, and I didn't really know. Like, I guess me going out with my friends was a trigger that I found out because one day I had all my friends over at the house and we was getting ready to go to the river rock downtown seven, eight people in the living room and I'm upstairs getting dressed and I came downstairs. She came downstairs and started going off. 
y'all get ready to go do X, Y, Z. You probably going run to run into some hoes. You probably this and you probably that and blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, she just reached into the kitchen cabinet, start grabbing plates. I ain't talking about paper plates and start throwing them at us like there was Frisbees. <laughs> I'm everybody running out the house. I mean, I still went. But. I don't know. It was just I would find out triggers as we went. You know, I already told you how she stabbed my ex. But you got to be willing to ask the tough relationship, tough relationship questions in the beginning. You have to. Or else you're going to end up finding out later. But I think an overall trigger you should be looking to avoid in relationships is to stay away from people who try to make you feel guilty. Try to paint you with guilt and shame all the time. The enemy is the accuser of the brother. That's what the Bible says. The enemy's job, the devil's job is to always point and accuse. You did, you, you did all the time. You, you, you. Now, I ain't talking about in a Diddy situation because dog for years wasn't being accused and was getting away with stuff and he thought he could. Now, all of a sudden, ever since the casting thing. <laughs> it's so funny because one day he said, I can't believe Cassie said that. Can't believe she said that. So crazy. All lies. She's stupid. And then the next day he paid her. Because she did something to everybody else. She didn't attack or go after or accuse Diddy. She went after his corporations. And it was like, okay, yeah, we got to pay her. And then all of a sudden everybody came out. So, you know, we, we reap what we sow. You can't get away with doing certain things over and over and over again and not be repenting. That's why I be openly repenting about the things that I've done haven't been perfect. Did this dirt bag stuff. I should have did this. Cheated on her. Shouldn't have. You pay for it all. Because as much as I say I'm an ex dirt bag, I can sit here and tell you every time that I've paid for it and it cost me. But Diddy, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you in a relationship with somebody and it's like every single thing you're doing. Wrong or right, you're being accused or you make a mistake. Let's just say you make a mistake on the finances. You overspend one time and you take the account into the negative. And now for six months, your ex, is, your, your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend is always reminding you, well, you know, two weeks, you put the account in negative. You be, like, then you constantly accusing me. I said it was a mistake. I apologize. When I apologize to somebody and they keep reminding me of the mistake and keep accusing me, it's like, damn, man. Not only have I apologized, we put a plan in place so it don't happen again. That was a mistake, but you're going to keep accusing me? Now, again, this ain't happened to me in years, but I'm just saying. You got to be careful when you're in a situation with an accuser. You got to be careful when you're in a situation with, with, with a manipulator. See, manipulation is somebody to use in their thoughts, words, and their actions against you to do things to benefit themselves because there's a difference between persuasion and manipulation persuasion benefits both parties manipulation only benefits one so you're in a situation where you can constantly manipulate you really look need to look at that like what's the core of that like that's a trigger for me that's an absolute trigger for me um Man, I don't know why I got to mention this, man. I have also too when 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 I talk about observation, revelation, and recommendation. So when you get a ops a revelation about a friendship or relationship with somebody, and you start to see what it really is, you need to be prepared to move along those lines. I had somebody reaching out to me. This is somebody I've known for years, years and years and years. It's a female. And she wanted me to be on a podcast. And this was like right after one of my videos that went viral. And I was like, man, first of all, I have no idea how some of these videos went viral. I don't know the formula on it. I just get on here and tell the truth. I detach myself from the outcome. I don't know what's going to happen. I do a video and then the next day somebody called me and said, your video is at one million. Somebody called me and said, Lil Duval posted you on his page. It's already at such and such. I was like, I don't even know Lil Duval. God knows him, but praise the Lord. 
or I did a put a video on TikTok. And somebody said, you know, it was at a million. I'm like, praise the Lord, man. I, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just giving truth and I detach myself from the outcome. I speak, I speak my truth. I'm having fun. I'm telling jokes. Detach myself from the outcome. So, um, anyway, right around this time when the, some of these videos is going viral, somebody I know, re, know reached out to me to do a podcast. And I was like, well, I'll let you know. I'll let you know. And then, like, a couple days later, somebody came to me and said, hey, do you know such and such? I was like, yeah. I've been knowing her for years. She said, you know, she was a teacher at my school. I said, for real? She said, yeah. And first of all, you know what I'm saying? I don't know if she don't think I know, but it's like, man, I know you, you know, I know you're part of the, the, the alphabet community. You can't hide it from me. I mean, you got a ball fade. You a female with a ball fade. You got a flannel on and some khakis. Like, you can't hide them hips and them khakis. You know what I'm saying? I know you probably on the other side. Flannel, you know, just, just strong masculine energy. You on the other side, and that's fine. Well, I, I would say it's fine. It's just that's your choice. But this young lady called me and said, I know her. Let me tell you about her. Now, I'm, this is while I'm considering doing a podcast. She said, uh, she was a teacher at my school. And somebody I went to school with, she was grooming these young girls at my school and bringing them to the house and like having sex with them. I was like, what? You lying? She said, I ain't got no reason to lie to you. She said she took somebody I knew to her house like and she preyed on girls who didn't have fathers in their house and that like, came from broken homes who mamas wasn't always home. She said she'd mentor the young girls and in the process of mentoring them, she was eating on them. I was like, oh no, I'm not doing that podcast at all. She's a predator. And I ain't gonna say her name or nothing like that. You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying, you know, when somebody, when God reveals to you what's going on with somebody, how, what, what, what they got secretly that they don't think you see, you need to take that into consideration and move accordingly. I know I do. I have dreams. I'll be praying. I'll be having dreams. And I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I know now, like, I'll be praying and asking God to show me stuff about certain people. And when he showed me, I'm like, oh, they out here moving like that. Appreciate you, Jay Jimerson. Accountability. You said, I just caught that short vid of your daughter telling her view of the time you got shot. That's wild to have to go through that truth. Hey, I'm grateful. Shout out to you, Carolina One. Man, my baby girl, She, I, I'm so glad she took the time to tell that story. And for people who haven't seen, like, the, it's went viral so many times over. And when people repost it, it go viral. And I'm, again, I, I ain't smart enough to know the algorithm or whatever I'm doing. I'm just, I tell my truth. But um, my daughter, Angel, boss Angel, she uh, made a video talking about her perspective. Because I got shot. The bullet went through my arm and went across my son. My son was two. He was in my arms. The bullet went across his forehead and it went through the front window. The, the other parts of the story, because there's so many parts of the story I, I haven't told publicly, but my daughter did. My daughter's was on the front porch and the bullet went in between, out the window, in between the two of them and um it was uh that whole day was 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 wild but at the end of the day i picked somebody i remember her her grandmother was telling me you better not marry her she crazy and you damn sure better not cheat on her and we were cheating on each other for a long time but married her anyhow whatever we in this tumultuous relationship and this day particular day and my daughter shares the story like it hit her channel boss on jail um so the day we was arguing it was just a stupid argument she didn't want the kids to go outside it's a beautiful day outside she wanted to stay in the house so she could not do nothing and her, she was really torn 
because at this time I had stopped cheating and doing street stuff, but she was still participating. So she was torn. And um, we got into this argument. I was like, let the kids go outside. She said, no, nah, because she was mistreating my babies, really. And I was sticking up for them this, as I always was. But this day I was sticking up for them like, you know what? I'm going to take them to my mama house. So we get into an argument about that. And she goes into the kitchen and grabs a gun. And in the middle, because the comments are so funny, because people are like, what would you what you do to her for her to shoot you? And my daughter will tell you, and I'm sitting here telling you, we was having an argument on how she was treating the kids that day. At this particular time, and it had been probably like a year, and I, had, I hadn't cheated on her. I hadn't cheated on her. So there's no cheating going on when she shot me. Just an argument. It was no cheating going on on my part. She was still living two lives. And when you live in two lives forever, eventually, you know, the stress will catch up with you. So we get into an argument about the kids. I try to leave. She shoots me in the arm. Bullet goes through my arm, grazes my son's forehead. Uh, and the bullet goes through the front window in between my door. I'm looking how amazing God is. And she tells the story about how she looked at her brother and he had blood rolling down his face. Because the bullet grazed his forehead. Like it actually like went in the skin. It just went across. But his whole face was full of blood. I actually thought he had got shot. Right after it happened. Then the bullet goes out the front window in between my two daughters. That's why I always say, like, when it's your time to go, it's your time. When it's not your time, God will spare you. That bullet literally did an S curl and then just dropped. And that was a trauma. That was a trauma. And, I, you know, when I get into relationships or or the really, really dope friendships with people. Like I mentioned that, like, man, this is a trauma that I went through. Like I got shot. I was 23. It was 20 some years ago. So basically she did three years after she shot me. Got out. She got with the, she had a baby by somebody else when she was married to me. Had me sign a birth certificate and everything like a dummy. <laughs> But I knew he wouldn't mind because when he was three months old, I was like, hey, look, I know we've been cheating on each other. I've stopped. But little dog, he's not mine, right? And she just bust out crying because I knew he wouldn't mind. He looked Chinese when he came out. I'm like, who's this Chinese rice eating baby? This is not mine. Loved him, though. Loved him like he was mine. Matter of fact, when she got locked up and went to prison, I just I agreed to hand him over to his father. And tearfully so, because I had had him since birth. So here he was like a year or so old, and I was passing him off to his biological father. And he was crying, pulling on my shirt. And fast forward, the biological, his biological father, who I passed him off to, was the one that she murdered not too long ago. Right. So this man who watched her shoot me, got into a relationship with her when she was released from prison and she ended up killing him. You got to know the person you with. You got to know their background. You know what I'm saying? And really now, like, it's so much stuff going on in this trans movement. When you dating somebody, you need to ask for their birth certificate, dog. Yeah, that story's super crazy. I'm grateful to be here. It's so many aspects to that story when I think about it, like nights before, it was so funny. Somebody jumped in the comments and said, uh, explain how a revolver jams, Charlie. I don't understand that's the part of the story. So really, I say the gun jams because it just speeds the story up. But if the long version of the story is a few nights before I got shot, I had a 32 revolver. There was a raccoon in my backyard terrorizing the garbage cans. I shot the raccoon twice and never reloaded the bullets in the gun. So when I put the gun in the cabinet and days later, when she grabbed the gun during our argument, she shot me. One bullet came through. Somehow the next chamber was one of the chambers where the I shot the raccoon and didn't reload the bullets. And that's why I just clicked and nothing came out the gun because the gun was pointed. I was I would have been done. But while she was messing with the gun, I was like, let me go ahead and knock her off her feet 
before she figures out what's happening with this gun. Because I'm not going to just, you know, you, 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 what, what was I taught years ago? You run from a knife, but you charge a gun. Like I see my daddy do this one time. He, he, he got into an argument. We went to Detroit Dragway. My dad was a hot rod guy. He still got one now. He got a Trans Am with like a 500 in it. 73 years old. He still go to the racetrack. But growing up, I even got a video of it on my on my YouTube page. But growing up, we was at Detroit Dragway in, in Brownstown, Michigan, every summer. And my dad, he had a 79 Camaro with a big block in it. And every, I'm talking about every summer we there. I grew up at the racetrack. That's why I'm a car guy now, because of my dad. Um, so every summer we at the racetrack. And uh we get into my dad gets into an argument with this guy at the racetrack because he lost. He was mad. He was trying to leave and the dude wouldn't move. And it was a long line of cars that were lining up to go race. And it, the line was so long, it was blocking people who were trying to leave. So my dad's trying to leave. This dude had a grand national. I'll never forget. He asked, dude, he was like, can you move your car? I just want to leave. And the dude had a smart mouth like, well, I move when I'm ready and blah, blah, blah. My dad was like, all right. Hopped in the dude's car. I think that's why I'm all about action now. I'll bring it to you. I got so many examples in life where I bring you something. Hey, can you do this? And you don't, then I just take action. I just watched my dad take off. Can you move your car? I want to leave. I'll move when I'm ready. Okay. Pops hopped in dude's car. Just brushed past him. Hopped in his car to move it. Was looking for the keys. Right? So then the dude walks up to the car where my dad was and acted like he was opening up his jacket. And I watched my pops hop out the car and grab dude's jacket. What you reaching for, dog? He didn't say dog. What you reaching for, man? What you, what you reaching for? What, what, what? What you trying to do? And dude was like, no, no, no. I'm just trying to get my keys, man. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Move this car. But you ain't. And he got in the car. He was like, y'all see that? I'm trying to reach. I ain't about to let you grab nothing on me. Like, you charge a gun, but you run from a knife. Learned that from Pops. Heard it somewhere else, but saw it from Pops. So she messing with the gun, trying to get it to work. And and uh, uh, I was like, man, wait, charge. Okay. Set my son down and just rushed her. And I popped her. Wham. Snatched the gun. And then I kept working. I heard her a few more times. You done shot me. You done shot my son. You know what I'm saying? Try to kill me. I'm about to rearrange your grill. You know what I'm saying? That raccoon was my guardian angel. 100%. 1,000%. And it's just the aftermath of it. Like, I remember um, going to the police station right after because it was like how do I explain this man my wife laying here bleeding because I knocked her out I ain't gonna lie I UFC'd her I, I got on top of her and popped her about 10-15 times tried to kill me you know what I'm saying um so I go to the police station because I'm trying to figure I don't know what I'm doing she knocked out I'm bleeding. My son bleeding. The kids is traumatized. I don't know what to do. Neighbors going to call. Let me just go to the police station. So I went to the police station. I called my mama. My mama came and picked up the kids. Ambulance came and escorted me to the hospital. While I'm in the hospital, and I got shot. I was living in Inkster at the time. Right on Magnolia Street. Um... She got a Wikipedia page, dog. I'm crying. Let me look this up. I'm going to get back to the story. I'm going to be able to get on point. I got to see this, man. She got a Wikipedia page. I'm crying. No Walker Hurt. N E W O K E R. H U R T. Let 
Man, it says workers injured. I'm crying. Worker hurt. Man, there's so many pages. If you just look her name up, the worker hurt. Law and crime. Georgia woman. Count your blessings. True crime. Everybody didn't went viral telling this story. I got a movie written about this story. It's going to be out soon. In Jesus' name. Yeah, you look her up. If you think I'm lying. N-E-W-O-K-E-R, last name Hurt. And the sad part about it is when she started talking about her triggers and her traumas, man, I, I really hate to say this, but it's real. When somebody has not healed from their triggers, from their traumas and their past hurts, I understand their behavior. How would you behave if your mama, and I'm not, again, I'm not uh, validating any of her behavior, anything that she did. You know, I'm still saying it's wrong, but I'm saying if your mama locked you in the room at five years old for 20 hours and played music and did drugs and you never had a dad in your life. I mean, that's how I look at situations like how would I behave? Because I don't know what that's like. My dad was always there. My mama, my parents have never done drugs. They've never locked me in my room. I was always around both my parents in a loving home. I'd never seen dysfunction. I don't know how I would behave. We got to take that into consideration. And when we get into these relationships with people, we got to look at if this person stays this way forever, is this something that I can deal with? If it's not, then it's, you need to leave. The movie going to be fire, Rusty Fingers. It's coming. The movie's coming this year. So the ambulance picks me up from the police station after I got shot, takes me to the uh, hospital. My parents come get my kids. So I'm in the hospital. They looked at my arm. They did an x-ray. And I still got a lump on my forearm to this day where the bullet went in and came out on the other side. And uh, when they, um, and I'm so grateful to God. God did, orchestrated everything. This is not a clout thing. This is a God thing because no matter what, when it's your time, it's your time. So I'm there at the hospital. Bullet went through my arm. Everything's cool. They start wrapping my arm up and the detective comes in. And dog had a, <laughs> he had on an inspector gadget jacket like a tan London fog jacket. Like he was an ins like a true inspector. And he said who his name was and what police department he was with and blah, blah, blah. He said, well, Charlie, what happened? So in the middle of me explaining, he just yelled, that's not what happened. Okay. My voice just cracked. Like I had puberty. That's not what happened. All right. I'm gonna tell you what happened. You were beating your wife and she had to shoot you to get her off you. I'm like, no, that ain't it. And he had, right after they bandaged me, they handcuffed me and put me in the back of the police car. Heading back to Inkster Police Station. And I'm in the car like, come on, God. For real. I just kicked the camera. I kicked the cable from the camera, my bad. I'm like, come on, God. You already know. You was there, God. You saw it all. You know what I'm saying? Please help me. And I just prayed while I was in the car. I went back to the station. I took off my shoes. You know, they give you the paper slippers when you, in some jails, they, don't, they take your shoes and your shoestrings. They took my belt. And I'm in there just praying like, God, I just need your help. You know what I did. I was in there five minutes. And this, another police officer walked by the cell. And he looked at me and he looked at the people. He said, what's he doing in here? And it was like, he's, we locked him up because he, he hit his wife before she shot him. He said, that's not what happened. I was at the scene. That's not what happened. He said, release him now. I was locked up five minutes. 
they opened up the doors. They released me. They gave me my stuff. I called my parents. They came and picked me up. And we just thanked God while I was there by how he protected me, how he was with me. So at the end of the day, it don't matter what it looks like. God is always in control. God stopped the bullet. God got me out of jail. God kept me from being it because I was really like considering like, dang, should I stay in this situation? God got me out of that situation. And I look at it like I was fortunate. I got shot once. She pointed the bullet, at, the gun at me again and the gun jammed. She pointed the bullet at dude's head 20 years later and pulled the trigger three times. The gun didn't jam. It went through his brain and killed him. You look her up her name just to see a news article, but that wiki page is the next step above. Yeah, she out here. I don't know if people people know. I was telling the truth, man. Situations like y'all's the motivation is why I stay in school to be a behavioral psychologist. Did Ari Spear sue you for shooting at her? <laughs> you know, they'll take a white woman's story automatic without explanation. True. Yeah, we gotta go deep. We got to give detail. They won't believe us. But I'm crying. BM, I'm crying. <sighs> but honestly, I know what I want. I know what I don't want. And I look at my, my, my successes and my failures because I've made a ton of mistakes in relationships and friendships. I picked wrong. I wasn't listening to the Holy Spirit. I wasn't listening to the people around me. I wasn't listening to the in intuition inside of me. I was picking based on looks. I've made all of them mistakes, but I'm so grateful for every mistake that I've made because it's driven me to who I am now because now I'm in school. Now I'm in school too to be a therapist. Years ago, I went to Eastern, Eastern Michigan for years. I was a junior when I dropped out because I was working at Ford, making all this money. So I already got three years of credits. So last year, I got back in school to be a licensed psychologist, licensed therapist, for that matter, with a concentration on trauma. And I'm so excited. I've been in school almost a year, and I'm taking these classes, and this is the first time I've been in school where it's something I'm excited about. You know what I'm saying? I'm pursuing it. Now, who knows? When I'm doing stand-up on stage, I still have, I'm still using what I'm learning, cognitive distortions, uh, logical fallacies, um, even, the, even the definition of the difference between persuasion and manipulation. I'm learning all of these things in class. So I can still use them on stage. I still use them in conversation. But now, you know, when people want to ask what my credentials are when I'm giving mental health advice, mental health advice, I can say, you know, well, I've got a couple degrees. So shut up. Getting curved by a chick that's down to get their blast on while you're asleep at night. It's so bad, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, it, it's cool because I'm taking it slow. I already got three years of college under my belt. I don't need that much time, so it's no need for me to take 18 credit hours a semester. So I'm taking my time, but... I'm studying because I do want to be a licensed therapist. Even if I never use it full time, I kind of want to just have that under my belt because I just watch people make certain decisions and re relationships like the life. One of the most important decisions you can make in life is who your life partner is. And when I watch how people pick and I'm pretty sure people looked at me on how I picked in my past, I'll be like, what? Man, what? Christian Smith, you got to holler at me. You got my email, man. If you're on the therapy tip, let me know because I'm like, I'm so intrigued by human behavior and the human mind, really based on what I've dealt with in friendships and relationships and watching how people move. When people move a certain way, it's so funny when people don't think you see them. Like, dog, I see you. You're doing some bull crap, my man. I see you. But not only that, I'm intrigued by my own behavior. Like, why did I do that? That was stupid. Why am I entertaining that relationship? Why do I have this habit? Why am I continuing to do these things? That's dumb. I'm doing, Charlie's doing dumb stuff. Why do I keep doing it? I can't stop. Okay, you know what? It's time for me to study. So Christian, holler at me, man. I need that game. 
that knowledge and that wisdom because, you know, of course, once I graduate, then I may go into social work for a certain period of time. I mean, this is all while I'm doing entertainment. But I think what 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 the whole pandemic taught me, because I was so heavily reliant on auditions, Hollywood, and when it all shut and stand up comedy, like that's how I was earning a living. When it all shut down and I wasn't able to earn a living, I was like, dang, what do I have to lean on? Okay, I could flip cars. I'm living in Cali, can't really flip houses because they, they they cost way more than Detroit. What can I do? And me going without income and them telling me we won't let you audition unless you take a jab, like them telling me what I would and wouldn't do. I'm like, what else do I have to lean on? My dad always taught me it's harder to hit a moving target. I wasn't able to move. I was just a target getting shot. Like, I don't know. That those that and dealing with difficult people helped push me into this relationship. Um, not relationship, but pursuing this college degree. So I appreciate you, Christian. You know what I'm saying? 1,000%. Even though you've been cash apping a girl in Africa for six years, <laughs> I appreciate you. Even though Christian Smith wiper blades don't work in his car at all, he got he even had Rain X on his windshield for the last two years. Now let's get into the meat of this thing. What's this lady's name? Archie Lee, what's going on, man? You've been in here silent, just watching. Archie Lee got stomped at a Boys to Men concert last year, man. I'm really concerned. Why was Dog at a Boys to Men concert? Tripping. He got all Tevin Campbell's songs on repeat right now. Archie Lee is in the tub right now listening to Can We Talk by Tevin Campbell. Crying. Drinking turmeric tea. Charlie leaves the boogers on top of his nail to get it. <laughs> ah, whatever, dog. Whatever. You uh, you let Farnsworth Bentley slap you on IG Live for 20 bands. Would you let uh, Diddy slap you for 100 bands on IG Live? <laughs> All right, let's get into the meat. I want to talk about this lady. Okay, we talked about, I love bringing up these real life issues. What is this lady's name? Omama Osama. I like bringing up issues, real life issues of like crazy women. Omama Nelson. She's 56 years old. This woman was born in Egypt. Yeah, 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 she snapped. She snapped and she killed her. She unalived. See, I don't know if y'all know this or not, but YouTube, all social media released the AI bots into their social media at the beginning of 23. And it started to flag certain words. So that's why people using words like unalived or how they change. They put stars. You can't say N-I-G-G-A. They'll put N-I star star A because the AI bots started to flag everybody's videos. Um, so just be careful. So this woman unalived and then ate her husband. Omema Nelson. She was a model on Thanksgiving day in 1991. Omema Nelson. You can look her up. O M A I M A is a model who she killed, castrated and ate her husband for thanks. She ate her husband for Thanksgiving. That's a, that's a different type of bra. But when you look at her in 91, she she looked cold. She beautiful. She smackable. Let me read y'all this. On Thanksgiving Day, 1991, Egyptian-born fashion model 
Omema Nelson, who was 23, re repeatedly plunged a pair of scissors into the chest and stomach of Bill Nelson, her 56-year-old pilot husband, husband in Costa Mesa. I've been to Costa Mesa several times. Matter of fact, I ran a, I ran a few chicks in, in Costa Mesa area. It's beautiful out there. Some beautiful runs, too. Um, she hit him with an iron so much that it broke her hand. So Omema unleashed her fury. She claimed over, claimed over the sexual terror and other abuses to which Bill had subjected her to. Acts that reportedly including him pimping out his glamorous bride to old creeps in exchange for rent, cash, and in one case, a car. They was only married like a month. Okay, let's get to the details. You guys ready for the details? He used my, uh... yeah, he was, he was Thanksgiving. Let me read, uh, let me read this in my, uh, my real estate voice. See if you guys are ready for this. Damn it, where's the article at? Damn it. Damn it, Charlie. He chewed up, Charlie. Jesus Christ, Charlie. Where's the Omema chick at, man? Oh, here it is. Okay. When Bill, this is Omema's husband, died, she butchered his body on the kitchen floor, boiled his hands in oil to remove fingerprints, and stuck his head in the freezer so she could later break out his teeth. This is a different type of bra. Beautiful. Just think, these beautiful bras you be getting with, where you ain't asked them the previous questions about trauma, triggers, and all of that, or they passed, like all you thinking about is smashing. She's thinking about smashing out your teeth with your head in the freezer. Omema stuffed, so after she murked dog, Okay, no, let me get back to this. She boiled his hands to remove fingerprints and stuck his head in the freezer so she could later break out his teeth. In symbolic revenge, Omema made a point of castrating her husband as well. She chopped off his pipe and his bag. She, she, she basically took his whole kid off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not laughing at a dog. It's the word kid. This is funny. As Omema stuffed some body parts into a tra into trash bags and fed others down her garbage disposal, it must have occurred to her that she hadn't had anything to eat. According to court documents, Omema told a psychi psychiatrist that she prepared Bill's ribs with barbecue sauce, put them on the oven, and then, upon sinking her teeth into her dead husband's glazed flesh, she declared, It's so sweet. Oh, my God, I can't even make this up. At the time of the alleged cannibalism, Omema and Bill had been married for less than three weeks. What was Dog doing to her so bad that she did all this to them and they had been only married for three weeks? Now, I'm not saying he wasn't doing nothing foul, but why not just leave? You, you kill Dog chop up his body, put his head in the freezer to break out his teeth, and then eat his ribs? Just think, some of these bad brawls y'all dudes be messing with, this is what's in the back of their mind. I just love to put his head in the freezer and bust out his teeth, cook his ribs, and eat them. I'm so hungry. They had known each other for a total of five weeks. My man knew her for two weeks and married her. He had no time for observation, revelation, recommendation. He had no time to ask her about traumas, triggers, her past. If he asked her about his past, he would have find out some, found out some of the things that I'm going to tell you all later on. She ate dog's ribs. And she kept saying that he was a BDSM enthusiast. You know, he raped her on Thanksgiving. She feared her life. Three weeks? I'm not saying it's not true, but why didn't you just leave? So, and even if you would have killed Dog out of self-defense, 
Okay, let's just say it was self defense and she just had to kill him to get her off, get him off of her. Okay. But you took the time to chop off his head and put it in the freezer to bust out his teeth. You took your time to peel apart his body to cook his ribs. That's a bit extreme. She said, I did his ribs just like in a restaurant. It was so sweet. It's so delicious. I like my tender. That's not a sane individual, ladies and gentlemen. A woman eating her husband's ribs and saying that it's sweet and tender. Wow. Sweet and tender. So what does it say? It says, the psychiatrist asserted that in Omeima, her name is Omeima. Omeima was in psych psych psychotic state when she often ate Bill and added that in 20 years of his practice, he had never experienced a conversation with a subject so bizarre and so psychotic. In turn, defense attorneys painted a horrifying, heartbreaking portrait of Omeima's ordeal growing up in Egypt as a child. She had been subject to female genital mutilation which means clitoral circumcision, that's cutting off a woman's clit, and submitting herself to loathsome sexual humiliations in order to survive. The defense also portrayed her husband, Bill Nelson, as a sick person who tortured his wife sexually, physically, and psychologically. When she adopted a kitten, for example, Bill allegedly pulled the animal from Omeima's lap in a moving car and tossed it out a window. Now, I'm not saying what dog was doing was not is not true i am saying it was a short amount of time they were married why couldn't she just leave and why she have to eat his ribs and why she say they were tender and sweet um let's see she was sentenced to 27 years to life in prison she denied eating Bill, which and then she confessed that she said his meat was tender and sweet. Then she said she denied it. She was denied her parole. Look, I don't know what y'all think about that. Was this in the eighties, right? Then he had the broad on. Snow heavy before he got took to the Dell. It is Hannibal Lecter vibes. She burned his biscuits. Sweet baby Ray sauce. I'm crying. Big Bertha can't wait to get it. Man, this was this was the 90s. This was early 90s. If you look a pick at pick of her, look at her name. You could look up her name in Google, Omaima, O-M-A-I-M-A, -M -A Nelson. Now, at the time, she wasn't really bad looking. She probably monstrous now with a short haircut and a flannel. She'd been locked up for a while. She's You you can't leave any kind of carpet around or she'll roll it up, put mustard on it and eat it. <laughs> but I'm saying she was bad back then. But when you see these beautiful women, man, you got to really... You got to ask the questions. You got to be able to look past the beauty and ask the appropriate questions. And women, even with men that you're attracted to, you got to ask the appropriate questions. What are the triggers? What are the traumas? What you've been through? You got to wait and take your time. Now, I don't doubt this stuff that they said about her. I doubt, It was probably true. Because look what she did to him. She cut off his hot dog. Hurt people hurt other people. So the documents say that she experienced clitoral mutilation and was forced to do all kinds of sex acts to survive in Egypt. So you attract what you are. Now, Bill, her husband, or whatever his nigga name is, he was probably a dirt bag too. Carlton Banks, what's popping, family? You see Carolina One, do you see how she looks? She do look like one of them Prince new generation vanity type bra. She was, she bad. But when you see these beautiful women, 
you still need to be able to contain yourself and ask the appropriate questions. It's so much more important. There are so much more important things other than the vagina. Now, am I saying Bill wasn't a dirtbag? It's the article says that he was. Says that he was a dirtbag. He my man's is in the stuff. I can't even imagine. He was pimping her out and all this other stuff. And let's just say when I read something, I feel like half of it is true. <laughs> Sexually, physically, and psychologically, she adopted a kitten. He pulled the animal from Obama's on mama's lap in a moving car and tossed it out of a window. Let's just say he did all of that, which is wrong. Does that warrant being stabbed to death and eaten? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. Even in my situation, like I even wasn't, wasn't even cheating no more. She still was. And when I was trying to take my babies back and tell, hey, look, stop treating my babies like this. She pulled the gun on me and she shot me. Everybody in the comments, not everybody, a lot of people in the comments was like, what was you doing to her? You must have been cheating. Even if I was, is that a reason for me to get shot? Now, when a woman leaves a comment like that, that let me know she's crazy. There's no reason to lose your life. Why couldn't, if dog threw her kitten out of the window, she should have just left. But you know what he was dealing with? He didn't take the time to do observation, revelation, and recommendation. If he would have did those three things, he would have been able to find out she got all these traumas and things that are bigger than me. This ain't somebody I want to mess with because all that freaky, crazy stuff that he was doing, he could try that on somebody else, but not on her because she 10 times worse than you. So if he did throw her cat out of the window and was doing that stuff, she's like, OK, I got you. Just think about what she was plotting while he was throwing her cat out the window, allegedly throwing her cat out the window, doing all this stuff. Oh, OK, you gonna throw my cat out the window. I'm gonna chop your head off and put it in the freezer and bust out your teeth. Those are two very contrasting uh, situations. Uh, throwing a cat out of the window, not saying it's, you know, super easy. It's something bad. But throwing her cat out of the window and she decides because you threw my cat out of the window, I'm going to chop your penis off. You know what I'm saying? You abuse me and now I'm going to kill you and eat your ribs. Those are com on a complete different ends of the spectrum. So you never know who you're dealing with unless you take your time not have sex too soon you got to be able to see a person that's why i like asking wild questions in the beginning to just see you know what i'm saying me my brother and my cousins we went to this uh shoe store and um uh man what is the name of that mall complex cali we went to a shoe store in cali and um, we go in, and I'm trying on some shoes. I bought a couple pair of shoes. And the, the sales, the saleswoman, I'm feeling her energy. She on my head. I'm just like, well, what's going on with you? And she, she was nice. She was nice looking. You know what I'm saying? She looked like she was like mixed. She had a big old booty, whatever the case may be. She was nice, and she was giving me all this energy. And um, I bought the shoes, and I was just like, what's going on with you? And then I asked my famous question, you know, if I gave you my, this was years ago, if I gave you my phone number, would you call me? She was like, yeah. So she texted me, she texted me the same, matter of fact, like 10 minutes after I left, she texted me. So we text him back and forth. And I'm the kind of person, like, I want to get to the dirt baggery right away. Cause I want to see where you at. And I felt it on her. I'm like, it's some, this is a weird vibe. Let me see where she at. So we text him back and forth and I just hit her with, I said, look, I know you got some videos in your phone that you don't show nobody, but I want to see. And then she said, it was a long pause. And she said, how do you know that? I said, I can feel it. Go ahead and send them. I'm not going to judge you. Send them to me. No, I don't have them. I'm like, don't lie. Because I want to get to it all right off the rip. The way you was acting, we attract what we are. So there's a dirtbag part of me that can see a dirtbag part in every woman. Even if I ain't doing it, the fact that I've got years that I've done it, even though I'm away from it now, 
I can still see dirt battery on a woman. And I'm like, what is that? Let's don't play with me. There's something on your phone that you don't show nobody. Why don't you show me? Show me a video. Five minutes later, she's showing me a video. She said, listen, I got a boyfriend. But I also meet guys from time to time. I have to tell my boyfriend I'm going to the grocery store. I meet these dudes in like the CVS or grocery store parking lot, you know, and we we do stuff in my car and I let them and I let them uh, spray in me. And she starts showing me video after video. And I was like, oh my God. I never end up hitting her, but it was just like part of like I saw it. I knew what I saw. You know, and that's people be blaming dudes all the time. She had a good square dude at home. And people be saying dudes is dirtbags all the time. But honestly, there's sometimes where there's a good wo woman got a good man. He had the crib. She just wanted a little spice. She she's lived her life a certain way. She thinks she can settle down. But then she'll run into somebody like somebody like me. Or I shouldn't even say somebody like me. She'll run into somebody who's like, you know, aware. And he'll bring that side out of her that ain't coming out of the, in, in the dude at home. She's showing me video after video of her just getting rammed in the car and getting clapped in. And I'm like, this dude at home don't even know. He actually thinks his woman is going to the grocery store to buy mayonnaise. Only to know that she's getting mayonnaise shot inside of her. She get home, she doing everything to push all of the seed out, and then you making love to her at night, knowing that some dude was just running her in the CVS parking lot. Wild. <laughs> you can't hit a broad in the parking lot? Come on, Six Mile, what's going on with you, man? How long? I didn't have his park a lot performances several times, man. Park performance, park a lot, public bathroom performances. Matter of fact, the chick that, that shot me, man, I think one of the reasons people ask me, what you see in her? She was wild. I remember she rode me on 94 by the tire on our way back to Detroit because we lived by the old McKenzie, like Joy Road in Wyoming. And I went to see somebody out in like Wayne or Romulus and we was back to the city. She had a skirt on and she just crawled on top of me and rode me while we was on the freeway. Every day I got off work, no matter what time, when my key was hitting the lock, I could hear her feet running to the door. And I'd open the door. She'd run up to me and jump into my arms every time I got off work. Like, I got into a fight one time at Metro Park at a basketball game, and I hit dude, you know what I'm saying, hit him again, and I ain't gonna lie, dog picked me up and slammed me. And while we on the ground, I'm trying to, I'm punching him, I'm hitting him in the neck, all of a sudden, I'm getting kicked in the head, he getting kicked in the head, it's her stomping him. So when people ask, like, why you get with these crazy bras, or why you get, like, there's a side of them that you don't get with a square bra. How many times have your woman ran to the door and jumped in your arms when you got off work? I'll wait. How many times you got into a fight with somebody? Well, maybe you don't fight. Maybe you a square. But I'm talking about for the do for those who ain't ain't afraid to fight. How many times you got into a fight and why you fighting dog? She come in and start stomping him. You know what I'm saying? I ain't gonna lie. How can I say this? I was on my way to go do something that I'm glad I didn't do. With a gun on me. And I was running down the steps years ago, 20 plus years ago. I was running down the steps to go do this. Because one thing about me, I ain't going to run my whole resume down, but there, there's these times where it's like nobody can tell me nothing. I'm going to do this, right? I'm running out of the house. Got a 38 snub on me. And I'm like, I'm about to go do this. And I'm going down the stairs. And anybody know anything about Detroit houses with wood floors? The wood floors can be slippery, especially on the stairs. So I live right behind the Dairy Queen, Joy Road in Wyoming in Detroit. I'm running down the stairs because I'm just, she saw me going to the cabin and get the, you know what I'm saying? Where you going? 
man, I'm about to go handle something. I'm pissed. Some stuff happened. I don't want to go into it. And I'm just like, I'm on my way down the stairs and I'm running. I get down to the fourth or fifth step. She jumped off the top of the stairs onto my back, tackled me. What are you doing? We just had CJ. He was like three months. If you go do that, you ain't going to see your son be raised. Jumped on my back, talked me out of it. Like I can sit here and talk so much trash about her. I'd never be with her. And that toxicity is a relationship I'd never really want again. But at the end of the day, she saw me when nobody else saw me. She did the things that I knew. Like, that's so exciting when you get home and your wife is running to the door to jump in your arms, stomping people. <laughs> I don't know why. Stomping people above it. Every time, dog, I love the crap. Facts. She was so do or die. Jay Gray, what up, though? Yeah, I had a 38 snub, man, at the Chrome Boy with the speed loaders. You know what I'm saying? A beautiful thing about a revolver is you clap something, you keep the shells, you keep the evidence. Shoot something with a with an automatic, all the shells hit the flow. Yeah, they 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 them 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 crazy bras is it's wild. And what they I remember somebody stole my dog one time. I had a dog. I just bought an American Bulldog. I paid $800 for the dog. And, man, I set him outside in the backyard for like one minute to run down, two minutes to run downstairs and grab his dog. When I came back, he was gone. I told her, I was like, somebody took the dog. She went and grabbed the gun and jumped in the car. I'll be back. I'm going to find our dog. I ain't see her for two hours. Gone. Riding around with the gun. You know what I'm saying? It's just certain. Sometimes I just like action. Just take action and get it done instead of what are we going to do now? What are we going to? You know what I'm saying? She was. She was wild, man. Kind of like that at that time because I was wild. Absolutely wild. But. You know, at the end of the day, you 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 need balance. Somebody that's going to bring. The best people to be around are the people who want to see you at your highest and best use. You know what I'm saying? In my humble opinion. Humble, highest and best use. And even though she was running to the, the door to see me, ride me on the freeway, stomping people when we got into fights. You know what I'm saying? Um, one thing she never did is I never heard her dog me or talk and this was before social media this is like 99 2001 but she never dogged me publicly you know what i'm saying so she was just solid to some degree but i just you know I mean, at the end of the day, I just can't stand people that's just lying, not being transparent. And there's certain things that are traumas and triggers for me that I'm looking for in relationships. And I think you should be willing to look for those things, too. Like. Based on her past and what she saw, she just wasn't healed from her past traumas and her triggers. And when you're not healed and you don't give that to God for him to wash you and forgive you then you're walking around hurt people or hurt other people. And one thing, and also too, those people put people on a pedestal and that's what I never want in relationships no more. I never want to be put on a pedestal because of accomplishments or how I look or how transparent I am or, or anything, because I will let you down. If you put me on a pedestal, the only person that's supposed to be on a pedestal is God, Jesus Christ. People going to let you down. People going to be imperfect. You know, when I hear people talk about how much they can't hate what somebody did to them or it's like I don't put my trust in people. I never publicly talk about what people have done to me that I don't like. People going to do some stuff you don't like. The Bible says offenses will come. They don't have to be taken. I'm not going to talk about what people have done. I talk to them personally. We squash it out. If We got to separate and, and, and not be a part of each other's lives no more. That's cool. But publicly. It's no need. It's no need at all. 
So I just hope this helped y'all. At the end of the day, pick wisely your friendships and your relationships, not just your relationships, your friendships too. Who you pick to be around. Observation, revelation, recommendation. Asking the right questions, man. We just out here spending time with people. I've been knowing him since the first grade. Is that the person you should be around? Glendon Johnson, what up, though? Who you have around you is so important to your growth. These people around you should be at your highest and best use. And also to you want an environment that brings out all your gifts and talents. The Bible says a man's gift will make room for him and bring him before great men. How can your, your gift won't make room for you if you're around a bunch of negative people in a terrible environment because your gift won't even shine. So. You want to be around people who want you at your highest and best use. You want to be in an environment that is conducive to your gifts, talents, and abilities, even if it's a job. You know, I work a part-time job right now. I drive a truck. I ain't going to lie. It ain't no reason for me to front. I drive a semi-truck with a 48-foot trailer part-time. And then the other part-time, I'm taking care of my kids. I'm doing my gift, TV, all the commercials, blah, blah, blah. But the reason I had to do that is because I'm a man that stands on principle. They wanted me to take a jab to continue to do auditions. I wasn't willing, so I had to walk away. But when you're around people who don't want you at your highest and best use, they're going to make you choose a bag over your well-being. I never choose a bag over my well-being. Because when my well-being is 100, the bag is going to come. 3 John 2 says that, we prosper and be in health even as our soul prospers. What's your soul, your mind, will, imagination, emotions, and your intellect? That has to be whole. When your soul is whole, you attract the blessing. I ain't chasing nothing. I ain't chasing the thing, man. Just be careful who you have around you, who you talk to, who you spend time with, where you go. Enjoy life. You take a day to just rest. You know what I'm saying? And don't be ashamed of where you are in life or where you were compared to where you are. Like, I can sit here like, man, all these commercials, TV show, man, I did all this stuff, and then now I'm, I'm like driving truck part-time. And So what? I was able to stand on, on all 10. I'm not putting nothing in my body that just for a bag. You look like a condor on butt. I'm crying. Who is that? Glendon Johnson? You got rain -X on your windshield right now because your windshield wipers don't work. <laughs> oh, man. You was listening to Anita Baker crying last night, drinking a bottle of wine. Yeah, I'm 10 toes down, man. I was driving the truck the other day, and I ran into somebody. He was like, man, you Charlie from Craig Facts, right? Man, I listened to y'all the whole time during the pandemic. Man, I miss y'all boys. Yep. Had a good time there, man. Out here on the truck now, dog. Part time. Good to talk to you. We chopped it for a minute. He was driving for, uh, I forgot the name of the company. But it is what it is, man. Man, listen, I ain't nobody special. I'm just a vessel. Speaking the truth. You know, but I got to do what I got to do to eat. So me saying no to the jab, me and I had to jump on the truck. I've been driving truck for almost three years now, man. It's been gravy. Can't do it every day, though. <laughs> for real. Sometimes I got to take breaks. Like, I got a really nice bag from a, from a commercial that I shot a while ago, man. And I took, like, six months off. Like, all right. But if I had to drive semi, five, six, oh, I bet I'd be. Listen, I did it, though. I did, like, six days a week for a minute, man. It drove me crazy. Yeah, man. And I stay local, too, man. You know? I drive, like, five, six hours, and I'll be done. I don't do no over the road. Gone three, four days. I don't know that. I got to be home. I want to spend time with my kids, my family. 
You know what I'm saying? But it's uh, it's always good. I want to end on this, man. One of my baby mamas called me a while ago, and she told me that uh, that her husband was hitting on her. Now, this is the one that was giving me all kind of problems with letting me see my kids and all of that. Just being a weirdo. So she said, "My, you know, my husband hit me. I said, put him on the phone, man. So she put him on the phone. I said, man, how does it feel? Because you're doing what I wish I would have did years ago. She deserved to be punched in the face. <laughs> man, I was jealous of dog. How does it feel? You caved her grill in. I am kind of pissed though, because he hit my he hit my one of my daughters though. I know, and then nobody want to tell me until it happened years later. But I ain't forgot. You know what I'm saying? So uh, we're gonna deal with that when the time is right. But I had to ask him, man. How did it feel when you punched her in her face all that time? So man, I'm about to wrap this up, man. Y'all can check me out at ilovecharlienewhart.com. Don't forget, man, you know, like I said, I saw Lizzo at Somerset Mall. She had a flat tire. She walked out to her flat tire and dropped her knees, put her mouth on the valve stem and blew up the tire in 20 seconds. I ain't never seen nobody blow up their own tire with their mouth. Lizzo is a walking air compressor, and I love her for it, man. 1,000%. She's a G. Oh man. Glendon Johnson, you uh let your uncle grab your booty when you was eight. And every time you see him at the family dinner, you think about it like, man, why did I let him do that, man? Your uncle nasty, dog. Carlton Banks, what's popping, man? Carlton Banks, I can't see his picture, man. He one of y'all. W. Booba, what up? I bet you W. Booba look like Tyrese. You know my problem with Tyrese? Tyrese, the fact that he let dogs slap him and beat him up in Baby Boy. You, The man who beat you up in Baby Boy is the same man who got raped in Pulp Fiction. It's the same man who uh played Holiday Hardy, played a trans person in a movie. Like, this is the dude who you let beat you up in Baby Boy. That's my problem with Tyrese. Not that he was whining about his baby mama and the child support. How much more do you want from me? No, that ain't my problem. My problem is that you let Holiday Hart slap you in Baby Boy, dog. Crying. Me and the wife are 26 years on the pick. Oh, that's beautiful, Carlton. 26 years, man. Shout out to you, dog. Just renewed the vows after 25. Hey, man, congratulations, man. That's beautiful, Carlton. What's the secret, fam? Don't marry a rat? <laughs> I'd have been married several times, man. Damn near 30 years. That's beautiful, man. Like, my mar- my parents been married for 50 years. My dad is 73. My mom's 72. In June of this year, it'll be 50 years. I want that. I've just learned how to pick better, man, and heal. But shout out to you, Carlton. Proud of you, bro, bro. I appreciate all y'all tuning in, man. Um, Y'all know what it is. Y'all both 46 and going strong. Y'all got married young. Going strong, that means you popping uh blue rhinos and honey packs to smack, or you are you smacking naturally? How are you looking? Are you smacking naturally or are you honey packing out? You know, y'all gotta stay away from that sugar, man. Y'all be drinking all that alcohol, eating all that sugar. You know, it starts to mess with your man meat later on, man. You'll be soft. 21 back in 98. Oh, y'all my age. I was born in 77, man. My high school sweetheart is trash, though, so I wasn't going to marry her. 
You was born in 79, W. Booper. You off those blue rhinos or what? W. Booper's the kind of dude who just takes blue rhinos before he go to work just for no reason. 77. Since the second grade, Ben Frank, we've been rocking. I got to send you that picture with me and you in the second grade at Showbiz Pizza, both wearing Buffalo Tusk Cartier glasses, man. All right, man, I'm out of here. I love y'all because I love myself.